This is my presentation on kinetic painting and its implications. Before I can explain what kinetic painting is, I have to explain three basic motions. And there's a lot of different types of motion, but they all fit in under these three categories. Actual motion is one category, and it's almost obvious. It can be, uh, an art form can be controlled by motors, wind, or powered by motors, wind, and water, or water. One example of that would be a mobile. Mobiles are powered by, consider powered by wind, but you can touch them and they move also, so they can be hand powered. Uh, the second one is virtual motion, and virtual motion is where it starts really getting intellectualized. Virtual motion is uh, non-existent in physical terms. But let's say like an op art painting. Our eyes would take that op art, the colors in the op art painting, and um, translate that through our optical system. And in our brain, we see some kind of motion, movement. And that would be a virtual motion. There's other kinds. There's an implied motion. Um, Implied motion was used a lot by constructivists in their sculptures, which, um, which was taken originally from the cubists. They uh, translated that into three-dimensional terms, and through the shapes of the sculpture, uh, there was an implied motion. So that's another virtual motion. Another type of motion, virtual, that I just found out about while I was writing this paper uh, is called articulated motion. Articulated motion, let's say like the spectator walks around a sculpture and um, he's looking at it or she's looking at it and it, it's not moving. Articulated sculpture doesn't move. So the viewer would say, well, where's the motion? Where's, how's that kinetic art? The intellectual would say, well, because it was built with uh, a ball joint or some kind of uh, hinge that you can move the arms and legs, that it's in a position of motion, that that is articulated motion. So you can't get away from the intellectualism because that's been an art through, from the beginning, and kinetic art is no different. But uh, there's other kinds probably that I haven't heard of. But that's virtual motion. And spectator motion can utilize virtual motion, or actually does utilize it. One example that I like to use are screens. When you overlap screen, screens, uh, at some point when you get the right position, you'll see a new pattern emerge from the two overlapping screens. If you have that built in into your artwork, and the viewer or spectator is watching that, uh, looking that and moves, then the pattern created by the two screens also moves. That is spectator motion in the art form. Other types are like the uh, constructivists used, the uh, reflective metals or plastics. And uh, not only was it implied, but they had virtual motion in there through the reflection of the surrounding areas by way of spectator motion. The history of kinetic fine art is a theory that I developed. So I named it kinetic fine art. And um, it was a theory that I developed to simplify what kinetic art is so that the layperson or anybody could understand kinetic art. So I devised three categories in the kinetic fine art to, to put all kinetic art into. Mostly to simplify. Okay, so because I want the objective to be that anyone can understand this. 
So these um, categories are defined by the major technologies that evolved through our, our modern times, which is the machine, light, and the computer. The first one I called machine aesthetic, and this is taken directly from Bauhaus. Bauhaus had a theory of a machine-originated aesthetic. I have to be careful what I say because I have someone here who knows a lot about Bauhaus, who taught me. But, uh, but anyway, um, the, it, it was a lot more than that, but that's what I'm focused in on because I'm focused in on kinetic art. And um, so I took the uh, machine-originated aesthetic term used by the Bauhaus and the theory, that was the name of the theory that they used, and just called it machine aesthetic. And the reasoning I use for that uh, is that the constructivists uh, like uh, Nam Gabo started uh, with as a constructivist and was hired by Bauhaus as an instructor. And um, while he was at the Bauhaus, he was influenced by the theories of the machine-originated aesthetic and actually started, uh, the artists there at the Bauhaus started changing that theory to mean more by adding actual motors to their sculpture. And it, a lot of the art back then, like uh, <clears throat> Mahali Nash's uh, light machine, was actually called machine art back then. So machine aesthetic uh, fits in to the time, the term. And um, Frank Popper, one of the noted writers for kinetic art and technology art, dates 1920 as the beginning of kinetic art. So that's the date I use for the machine aesthetic. And I also like to um, take some chances, and I'm going to say, um, all the motions that I mentioned previously, whether it be actual, virtual, or spectator, fit into the machine aesthetic. So everything, all the categories, the next two categories that I'm going to mention, grew out of machine aesthetic. Machine aesthetic lasted for quite a long time, even though light was around and was being used in kinetic art, but it wasn't prominent. The uh, machine aesthetic was more artists were working on mobiles and uh, actual uh, mechanized sculpture than they were artists working on light, with light at that time. Kinetic light I'm talking about, not just static light. Light aesthetic actually started with Frank Molina. Frank Molina is my favorite artist. Uh, he's a kinetic painter, just like me, only he did the same type of paint. He did hand painting, and he, did, uh, he used the technology of his time and incorporated the two. And I'm going to get more into that later as we go along. Computer aesthetic grew out of light art. As light art, light aesthetic, um, excuse me, I, use, I make that mistake a lot, light art. Light art actually isn't kinetic art, okay? Some of it isn't. And I'll get into that a little bit more. And of course, this is my theory. And uh, so light aesthetic, as it grew out of machine aesthetic in 1956, uh, computer aesthetic grew out of light aesthetic. And I changed that date several times. I just changed it again today. So I choose 1966 now as the beginning of computer aesthetic, and I choose um, Nam Jun Pak as, uh, as starting that impetus of uh, computer aesthetic. What I call computer aesthetic is, my definition is, the use of electronics or a microchip or mathematical pro programming, or the combination of those, to control the effects of light. Once light aesthetic went away from just 
motion and the artist started to control it with electronics and mathematical programming, it crossed over into computer aesthetic. And I'm going to explain more about that too because there's a lot of confusion in all these areas. Uh, let me go to the next slide. So each one of these um, categories has an incubation period. For instance, uh, machine aesthetic, it wasn't called machine aesthetic or kinetic art wasn't around, but it was actually um, being used for a very long time. I found, at first I found out that uh, ancient Greece had invented the hydro clock, but just recently I found out that some people say that Arabs invented the hydro clock. I'm not going to get into controversy, I'm just going to say that the hydro clock could be an early incubation period for what actually eventually developed in the kinetic arts. Constructivism is actually the real incubation period for the kinetic arts, or as I call it, kinetic fine art. And um, through constructivism and the implied motion grew actual motion and mechanized sculpture. Mechanized sculpture is actually what started the movement. Although mobiles have been around for a long time before that, they didn't actually start the movement. It was when the mechanized sculpture was uh, uh, developed by Mahal Nash. I was taught how to say that properly. <clears throat> that, uh, that the uh, mechanized sculpture was uh, very influential in starting the kinetic arts along with all the other people who were working with implied art and the mobiles like Al Alexander Calder and uh, they all contributed to the beginning of um, machine aesthetic as I call it. But the constructivists where I give credit and the Bauhaus the Bauhaus is actually, I give them the credit for, because they were an institution. And um, with, their, um, they, with their influence and them working on mechanized sculpture is what, what really gave the impetus to uh, kinetic arts or kinetic fine art. And I like to... Um, just point out briefly that Nam Gabo in 1920, while he was working for Bauhaus, kinetic some, uh, made some kinetic sculptures. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that was the period when he was converting from, uh, actually, he always stayed with implied art, uh, implied motion, but he was actually experimenting with mechanized motion around this time. Mahali Nash was experimenting with his space segments in 1923. But what he's really known for is his light machine. Now, he called it something else, but translated, it's a light machine. Uh, this mechanized sculpture that you see on the screen, as you see, has light incorporated into it. But let's remember that uh, the machine is what the focus of the art form was and um, light was only part of that focus. It wasn't the main focus. So what you have here is a uh, mechan there's a motor attached to this uh, sculpture and uh, it turns and then reflects the light that's in there in the sculpture onto the wall and then the shadows move. And that's really uh, when kinetic uh, or uh, machine aesthetic took off big time. This is one of Nam Galbo's pieces of implied art when he was, uh, this is originally done in 1916, but this is a uh, duplicate of it uh, that was done in 1950. But it's an exact duplicate of what he did in 1916. And, um, to give you an example of implied art, 
when he was in during his constructivist uh, period. This is another piece of Nam Gabo's uh, implied motion through not only the shape of the art form, the sculpture, but through the reflective properties of the materials used. And you see there's two layers of plastic, the inner plastic. As the viewer moves around viewing the uh, sculpture, there is an, uh, an amplification of light and motion when they overlap each other. Right now you see it in the picture, they're not overlapping. Okay, so light aesthetic also had an incubation period and uh, the color organ may have been the beginnings of the incubation period. Thomas Wilfred, who was a pioneer in kinetic painting, was also the um, inventor of kinetic painting and he, I call this uh, the beginning of the incubation period, the actual beginning of the incubation period for light aesthetic because light aesthetic really didn't take off. He was, he was by himself. I mean, basically, he was a, one of the only people that I've ever heard of doing this. And he made light boxes back then, and on those uh, translucent material on the light box, he would paint on that. But uh, kinetic art hasn't even been started yet at that point, so he was way ahead of his time. He was way before machine aesthetic or light aesthetic. And the machine aesthetic is also the incubation period for light aesthetic. It grew out of it, and I should have also added the Bauhaus. There's an incubation period for it. Now, here's some of the um, controversy that goes into what I see as controversy into kinetic art. Let's see if I can say his name right. Guglio Cuis was a, in my opinion, a great kinetic artist. But he made the first uh, recognized art piece using neon. This, he was recognized as the first design for neon. By, he was in um, Frank Popper's uh, books that I actually took that. And um, there's a common mistake. Technology art is commonly mixed with kinetic art. When people are talking about technology art, they always put in kinetic art. And it sounds like to the layperson who isn't informed that neon is kinetic art. Light art, and this is light art. It's not light aesthetic. He, I looked and looked and looked, and I've never seen him write or imply any motion, any articulated motion to his neon light. He could have, as you can see, there are shadows. He could have said, that's a virtual motion. But never, uh, if I find any of that writing, then I'll have to change this to kinetic art. But he never, the artist never implied any motion. That was presented as a design of light art. Who really started light aesthetic was Frank Molina with his Lumidine system in 1956. This is an example of his Lumidine system. Uh, we could see it with the light off better. If you look back there, you can see a little better, but it's smaller. And um, I'm going to show you how he built this, actually. So I'm going to move on from this. He's, in my opinion, the greatest all-time kinetic artist, kinetic painter, because I, he's my favorite, so I'm, I'm biased in that way. So anyway, um, computer aesthetic also had an incubation period. When Frank Molina was developing his uh, Lumidine system, unwittingly, he didn't know it, but by his use of electronics, to control the motors and the light patterns in his Lumidine system, he was actually starting the incubation period for computer aesthetic. As far as I'm concerned, uh, 
I just call it the incubation period because he was by himself at this point. When a lot of people joined in, then it turns into an actual move, movement in the arts. So later on, other people used electronics, but at that time, later on, electronics were used for computers. Before the microchip, before the transistor, before uh, there was the uh, tube and electronics. So that, that use of um, electronics and mathematical programming or the microchip or in any combination of that constitutes a controlling of the light patterns, which um, is a term that's used in art, kinetic art, is cybernetics. That's when, uh, when cybernetics came into kinetic arts or kinetic fine art is what I call the beginning of computer aesthetic. Before that, it was just light aesthetic. So light aesthetic had a short life, short and brilliant life, even though it is all the way through the, you see it in machine art and in computer aesthetic. So one of, some of the examples that I like to show of computer aesthetic is uh, Nam Jean Pak, uh, video synthesizer. He actually built some video, um, he was a video artist uh, long uh, before that, but uh, I, I believe his video synthesizer is uh, when the computer aesthetic actually started. Schofer did his light tower, cybernetic light tower, and Kowalski. I'm going to show you examples of these. This is an example of the video synthesizer. He considered himself a video installation artist. This being his first work, um, or one of his first works, or actually his first video synthesizer, but um, it wasn't a, actually an installation at this point. And he had help doing it. He had a partner. He had a, a friend making his synthesizer. This is an example of an installation. Each one of these little squares and larger squares on this uh, Installation here is an actual monitor, and that was put together, and that's an, a very huge installation. Okay, now um, this is Schofer's light tower, and you can see this is also huge. There's a road down there below it. And Kowalski's uh, field of interaction, I, I like to use Kowalski the most mostly because I like these uh, patterns of light that are on, in this uh, environmental uh, installation that he built. As the viewer moves through the installation, they set off sensors and different light patterns show up on the wall. So that's another example of the computer aesthetic, but this came a little later, a lot later. But a lot of people still work on this type of art. Okay, now that I've uh, explained the basic types of motion and I've explained the three categories in kinetic fine art, I've laid the groundwork so that whatever I say about kinetic painting, the layperson or anyone could um, place it in reference. Uh, the three categories I give for kinetic painting, one is the hand painted, it can be just strictly hand-painted. Op art, even though it wasn't called kinetic art, could be considered kinetic art because it creates motion in your brain as you view it. So I consider that a kinetic painting, and there's lots of them, tons of them, examples. But that's just the one that I, it's the most obvious that I use. High tech is another way of uh, painting and, um, kinetic, and making a kinetic painting. You can use um, an example of that would be uh, a programmer or someone using a program and displaying that, uh, the results of that program on a monitor. That's technology high-tech painted. Um, but you don't have to be a programmer. You can be a media art student 
and use the program developed by programmers for you to use and display that on a monitor and that is high-tech painting. So those are two types of kinetic painting. One is traditional hand-painted, the other one is high-tech which is technology painted and the third one try high tech and uh, it's a combination of hand and technology painted and that's the art form that I'm interested in the kinetic type of painting that Thomas Wilfred originally was interested the type of kinetic painting that Frank Molina did this is an example of a digital kinetic painting. This is actually hand painted picture that I did in one of my early kinetic paintings before I learned how to do this high tech kinetic painting. This was what I call low tech. The first picture was. That was just a screen painting that I did on people's windows. People used to like that scene. I just brought it into the computer, took a digital camera, brought it into the computer and added motion to it. So I call it a digital kinetic painting using moiré patterns. That's what I use for the motion. I'm going to get into that in a minute a little more. Here's a, another example of that. I'm going to try to speed it up a little bit. And this is more current. This is the picture that I did for my field project and I just brought it into the computer as a uh, digital image and added motion to it using um, the animation that I used with the kinetic painting. So it wasn't brought in all at one time. <laughs> the still was brought in and then the animation was uh, mixed with it in an animation uh, video uh, after effects. Did you have a question? So there are three types of kinetic painting excluding the digital <laughs> kinetic paint uh, kinetic paintings and there's probably more but the three main systems that I'm uh, going to bring up are Thomas Wilfred's he called it the Lumia thank you and he developed that in 1905 Frank Molina of course I mentioned a couple times is Lumadine Lumadine system and uh, Moray Tomas that's my name so I called it the high tech Lumia when you make things you can call it whatever you want and you can also make your name whatever you want so <clears throat> this is um, Thomas Wilfred and his um, Clavelox Jr. he had this made by a furniture company he made about 30 of them and uh, as you see he's got a keyboard in his lap he used to make really huge ones where uh, he performed in theaters and uh, I don't think he painted on these he, they were actually uh, considered technology painted it wasn't any hand painting in here as he evolved he went total high tech and uh, as he hit a button on the keyboard it would change the pattern of motion and I'm going to show you how he built that here's uh, an example of another Lumia type of art and you see it looks like a TV and there's a uh, translucent panel in the front well if you take that translucent panel off what you see is a cylinder that is powered by a motor it turns and there's a light source at the top and the cylinder reflects that light through the metal that's inside the cylinder and the metal is shaped a certain way so that you get different patterns onto the translucent material so the end result is this, like the clavel box. Uh, this is uh, Frank Molina, and his, he called this the Nebula, but it's one of his Lumadine system series. And I'll show you how he made that. He, uh, as you see him here, standing in front of this uh, beginning of a uh, what he called the Cosmos he laid out his motors first then he had a crew of uh, workmen or actually fellow artists who 
or contemporaries of his lay out the elect uh, the wiring they put in the wiring for him and the uh, light tubing then what you see here on the right side is the actual inside of the painting on the left side is a reflection of it it's hinged in the middle and they opened it up so that they can take a picture of it and uh, because of the light I don't you might be able to see the light tubes here in the reflection so that's what it looked like on the inside there were discs turning and he had different names for it I call it a disc he called it a rotor and uh, it would turn and the light goes through it and on the front surface when you close it he called that the diffuser that's one of the names he called it where it um, diffused the motion of the light with the painting and uh, created one piece it blended together and as you what happened oh and as you can see here um, a still does nothing for a kinetic painting this well for me it doesn't because I imagine all the motion of light going through this and how exciting it must look when everything is moving but all we see is a still so we don't have any concept of what that might have looked like since I've never actually seen it it's in uh, the Oxford University in England now I'll get to how Moray Tomas did his work he started out with uh, a monitor a plasmatron monitor and what you see is a flash I took a, of my digital camera and there's a silhouette of me in there but you can see it better with the flash and uh, hanging from the back of it you might see well you can't see it in this uh, illustration but there's silk screen hanging down here and uh, that's important when you're painting because this painting screen painting is actually mounted on a steel stretcher that I made for the plasmatron monitor and it fits right on it but when you're painting on it you can get the paint onto the monitor so the silk screen that I had hanging down here was pulled over top the monitor and it's in between the screen painting and the monitor and then you see the monitor by way of the flash so you can tell the monitor is back there and this is what it looks like without the flash with the normal lighting and then behind the monitor because they don't make plasmatron monitors as one unit and I wanted it to be one unit I had to find a mini PC off the internet and uh, build it into the mount, uh, wall mount of the plasmatron monitor along with the keyboard and the mouse so it looks a little clunky there but the viewer doesn't see that unless they look behind the uh, monitor this is the second layer of the uh, screen painting there's actually two screen paintings that go with this and this is the second layer which uh, you can see it's on the monitor by the flash and it's actually attached to the monitor this is what it looks like I had to put extra light so you see two lights the flash and the extra light that I put so that you could actually see the two layers together in combination so the first layer is connected to the uh, plexiglass and the second layer is connected to the monitor this is what the picture might look like at one point in the sequence of the animation as it's running without the flash and this is another point in the sequence of the animation the animation is about three and a half minutes long and this is an example of the animation which I only run part of it because there's a part in it that I want to show you this part here this is all done during, using moray patterns and the element behind moray patterns is line interference I'm going to get into that as I conclude but basically when you put a screen on top of another screen 
you get another pattern, as I mentioned earlier, and that pattern is made from the interference of the light and dark between the two, pat, uh, two screens. And it makes another pattern. And the pattern doesn't actually exist if you use screens, but your eye sees it as a pattern. Here I'm, I'm going to give you a little demonstration of what I'm talking about. And we don't need the lights off for this if you want to turn it on, Roger. Thanks. This is a simulation of two screens, and I'm going to anim I animated it in After Effects so that you can see the result of layering a screen over another. What it makes is another pattern, and if you keep moving it, it makes a kinetic moiré pattern, a moving moiré pattern. And that's exactly the way I made my animations, only I used different patterns for different motions. This is another example of making a moiré pattern. But this was made in 3D Max when I was in the Design Foundation program using moiré patterns just like I showed you just before. But I've gotten away from that. Now I use After Effects because I find it to be easier. Oops, excuse me. All righty, so now we're getting to the implications. The implications are the moiré pattern and line interference. The principle behind line uh, moiré patterns is line interference. So why is line interference a major implication of this art form? The art form and science one day will, co will come together to do great things. And why I say that is because line interference is already being used for science and technology, only the connection hasn't been made that it's line interference. For instance, magnetic lines, fields of magnetic lines, when they interfere with each other, create electricity. Holograms, when they were first made, they were first made by intersecting laser beams, and the interference point where they interfered with each other was recorded on a plate, and you had your hologram. Resonance, which is a strange phenomena, is created from the interference of capacitance and inductance frequency lines, what I call frequency lines, lines of interference. Uh, what resonance is used for, say like a, uh, a TV signal is sent over the airwaves or a music sound signal sent over the airways, it's sent by way of a carrier signal. And resonance, when you uh, put capacitance and inductance together at a certain uh, level point, in the IF can they have an adjustment you can make in the uh, radio or television, and the intermediate, intermediate frequency can, they call it uh, IF for short. Well, when you get the right um, level of capacitance and inductance, they cancel each other out. And that's called resonance. And whatever the frequency it's resonating at, it can capture signals from the air. So the broadcast is captured in the IF cans through resonance and through the miracle of line interference, in my opinion. And then, the, of course, the signal is filtered out of the carrier signal, and then we see it on the television. Uh, more implications. The moiré pattern was actually used in science in the 1800s to check uh, diffraction gratings by Lord Raleigh. That was the first recorded usage. Just recently, scientists have found out if you pass x-rays through DNA, then through a graphite crystal, I didn't have room for the, well, I probably did, but I didn't put graphite on there. Through a graphite crystal, what you see on the other end is a pattern. They called it a diffraction pattern. 
What is a diffraction pattern? Diffraction pattern is made from the interference of light and dark. That's a Moray pattern, in my opinion. Of course, the scientist calls it a diffraction pattern. So, what's it all mean? In conclusion, kinetic painting is not only aesthetically beautiful, but is a skill that when combined with high technology, becomes a powerful visualizing tool for explaining basic secrets of nature and possibly opening new doors to new technologies. So I want to thank you for being so patient. And that's my presentation on kinetic painting.